welcome. Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights here with Rich Klein. We're going to talk about 64 and 65 tops baseball sets, the product and our elections. Most of what we have was not bought at the time. I was in high school. Rich was younger, but great sets. I got them completed. Thanks, Tops, as a sort of presenting sponsor for this episode, but also Upper Deck and Panini, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, CompC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So those old top sets, they touch really all the sponsors could have contact with 64 and 65 tops. And so welcome to the show, Rich. What are your recollections of that? Because you would have gone back into it as a teenager, probably. All right, I was a teenager. I did complete those sets. Like you, I don't have them anymore. Here was one interesting thing in New Jersey. We had tons of high numbers in 65. High numbers were actually easier for us to get than like the fourth series card. Even though nowadays it's pretty much spaced out correctly. For me, the high numbers were never that hard to get. But maybe a couple of the better players were always trickier to get. The Tony Perez rookie, the Catfish Hunter rookie, Mel Stoudemire high number rookie card. The Mets team card. That's what you can go by. The demand players, when you see a lot of Catfish or Tony Perez, you can say, wow, those are not like the typical high numbers. But is your theory that they just came out earlier or they lasted longer or they overprinted them? Or was it a New Jersey anomaly that the distributor there overordered? I think it was just a New Jersey anomaly that for whatever reason, they just got there. I know in 67 in St. Louis, the 6th Series never got to St. Louis, and the 7th Series got very heavily to St. Louis because they're going to win the World Series that year. They were going to win the pennant. It turned out they won the World Series, too. 65, I think, was just an anomaly where New York, New Jersey got a ton of high numbers. I had no trouble getting 65 high numbers until maybe 1981. I used to be an aggressive buyer, and this had to be the mid-late 70s. My biggest score of high numbers... Two of them, really. One was 66 and 67s that I got in Kansas City. It was almost like a cut card case of high numbers. And the other one was in New Jersey from a guy you would know that had a cut case of 70 and 71 tops, mostly seventh series. I'm just wondering, New Jersey might be, for some of those years, the epicenter of the industry was New York City. There's no doubt that New York, New Jersey was huge at the time. I once bought from Tom Reed. With the exception of the very best players, and since we're talking about the 70, he once sold me 10 copies. They all were from, I want to say, a vent case or a cut case or whatever. 10 cards of each of the 70 high numbers with the exception of the very best players. Guess who got the very best players? You did. Me. Okay. It was more than 10 of some of them, Rich. But they were like pristine. They were just, yeah, they, they, they were had wonderful. never been in a pack. And I got them from a guy in New Jersey at one of those, I can't remember what the show was. but uh, Was it the Montclair State Show with Bill Jacobowitz and Pat Ganella? Yeah, it was Ganella. I got them from Ganella. Ganella still deals, by the way. Ganella I still think. does the Garfield Card Show. Wasn't he 80-ish? Yeah, whatever it is, he still deals. Pat had a fascinating rule. For many years, Pat would put cards away for five years. So he'd take his profits, that's, that's kind of what I buy got. stuff. And that's he hoarded it for five that, years. That was my deal. And then five years later, there'd always be new inventory for him. Pat had great stuff. I know. Was, and I wasn't that particular on condition in those days, but I appreciated having really great cards. But now I wish I'd just held on to every single one of them instead of trading them off over the years. Yeah, they'd all be 8.5s or 9s. I'm not going to say perfect 10s, but they would have been 8.5s or 9s. Mr. Mint used to say, if I opened it right out of a pack, it ought to be gem mint. It ought to be a 10. But in reality, just the fact of putting it in a pack can wax stains or corner dings and things like that. The safest buys were these cut cases that never were in a pack. They were in the vending boxes. And then somebody got them from Tops, directly from Tops. The thing I ever bought in a cut case was 82s. I had a bunch of Ripken rookies with off-centered backs. Actually a good thing because I had a premium at the time for the off-centered backs on the Ripkins. Yeah, not so much now because they wouldn't grade so well. They wouldn't grade <laughs> Well, okay. you could grade them as miscut bats. They'd grade okay. <laughs> let's let's go back to 64 and 65 tops. If I had a choice between one of the two sets, it's one of those places where I would break my rule. I would prefer the 65 set. Over I would the also do the more attractive. It has better rookies. Slightly better, but not way, way better. mantle card is a tougher card. The mantle is way better. Than instead well, of card number card. 50, the 64 mantle is a very easy card. The high numbers are tricky in 64. There aren't that many, but some of them are tricky. Of a full Negro rookie, 
that I've only owned one copy in my life. Right about that. But it's funny. We're, I think we haven't rehearsed this, but I just think, yeah, I'd rather have a 65 set. I think the mantle to me is the part of either set, notwithstanding Carlton or Necro or any of these other guys. I think Carlton. Would you rather have the 65 OPG or the 64 Venezuelan cards? I'd rather, Venezuelan's way tougher than OPG. But that third series, 65 OPG, is sneaky tough, too. One, the first two series are much easier. That third series, it's tough, and it's got a Murakami rookie in the OPGs which is a very popular card. In Japan, yeah. But still, I think the best card is a mantle. And I do find the 64 mantle. set is more completable. Is more completable. And both of them have really easy first series, not super tough high numbers. Fifth and sixth series, a little bit tougher, probably in both of them. And so I'm just wondering, I thought the paper quality or the condition sensitivity uh, that, that 65s I find in better shape, less handled than the 64s. Is that- I'm with you. And I think there were a lot more 65s and 64s. 64s also have some of my favorite weird card oddities on them. Archie Skeens on a two-player rookie card. On the back of his rookie card says, Archie has retired to become a school teacher. If you were going to invest in Archie Skeen cards, that probably put a screeching halt to that. You have the background on the Ray Sadecki card, which doesn't have a four-letter word, but it has a three-letter word, which is funny to see. Then you have other cards, like the Gene Conley high number card shows him as an Indian, but he gets hurt in spring training. He pitches like two minor league games. He never pitches for the Indians. And 64 just has a lot of really wacky things in it. 65 doesn't have the same wackiness. But 65, I still 65 better. Okay, you're at Tops, and it's 1964. And you're thinking about this set. And actually, this would have happened in 63 as they're preparing for the set. But in 64 and 65, they did standard size sets in baseball. But in football in 65, they had tall boys. In hockey, they had tall boys in the split year context. Okay. And they only did that one year. And then in basketball, they started doing tall boys, which makes sense for basketball. But you wonder if there was any discussion within tops about should 65 tops baseball be tall boys they did a 64 super set it's not tall boys but they did a larger size set in 64 and they overproduce that but it's not a flagship set but they do a set so they're definitely doing larger cards in 64 for baseball too i think this is a case of don't mess with success so you think football is an experiment I think football and hockey are experiments. They were like a boutique product. They weren't doing it on volume. They were just trying something. But they immediately went back to the standard size. They probably got things from the kids like, these don't fit in my shoeboxes. Not only that, it's 40% more real estate, more ink, paper, cardstock, press time, all that stuff. But they had two years there. They could have done it either one of the years. And that'd be interesting. But you're right. The plastic sheets were not the big thing. And shoeboxes actually do fit in a shoebox, but only one row. Yeah, think about it. The candy store people would say, why are we taking so much more room? Yeah, but you're saying for baseball, they weren't going to mess with it. Yeah. A flagship, we call it flagship. Now, that's because it's a really big deal. The the flagship product sets the tone for the year. And 2023 now is, I think, getting good marks. I have the 2023 cards. I think it's not the same, but I'll tell you, there is a design element in 65 that does not pop up very often. And those are the pendants on the card. Yeah, I think it's clever. It's A little bit bigger than I'd like, but it's a design element. Did you complete the 65 set first or the 64 set first? 65. Because I had the high numbers. They were easier to complete. The Necro, I think, was the last card I needed for 64. Necro Necro is a tough card in 65 also. Right. It it was a tough card, but I had maybe five of them. I had five of them popped up over the years. 64 took forever for me to get. What do you think Topps is doing with these two-player rookie cards? And like you got Lou Pinella, I guess rookie in 64, but he's got multiplayer rookie cards all the way for the next five years. What's Lou Davis, on? he's on a four-player card in 65. Then he's on a multiplayer rookie card in 66, 67, 68, and 69. And he gets a reasonable amount of at-bats in 70, and they don't give him a 70 card by himself. And he never has a card by himself, but he has five, two or more player rookie cards. Rich, I wouldn't have- tops at that time and neither were you but if we would have been there we're the kind of guys that would have said something so what are we doing here i mean they were larger sets but you've got 20 teams times 
25 players is 500, but you've got the team cards and the World Series and all that stuff. But still, you would think they wouldn't have to be given completely unproven five chances to make it. Guys that are retired or guys that don't even make the team. There's a guy named Wally Wolf, and he has multiplayer rookie cards in 63 and 70. It took him seven years, and he's still having two-player rookie cards. There are guys like that, guys we would call today 4A players. They bounce around. Right. Phil Necro, until he got the knuckleball, was in reality a 4A pitcher, which is why he's on a two-player rookie card in both 64 and 65. He's on, I believe, with Clay Carroll in 65. Yeah. Or it could be Cecil Upshaw, but I thought it was Clay Carroll. That's why he's on two-player rookie cards, because until he got the knuckleball, he's a 4A pitcher. There wasn't any Baseball America. I guess there was Sporting News, and that was pretty much it full box score type keeping up with each team and the farm. No, you did get in June the baseball register each year and the okay. baseball register did listed a lot of guys the sporting news thought would be on the cusp of being major leaguers too. If you played in the major leagues, you would get a baseball register listing. Sometimes they'd have people they thought would make it as rookies or they knew by the time the book went to press, we can print the last year's card. They were the majors. We were not collecting contemporaneously at that time, but rookies weren't really a thing other than if the guy made the team and you wanted him for your set or complete your team or the guys you liked. But it wasn't like, wow, this is the first appearance of Phil Necro, who actually was a good pitcher even without the knuckleball. To show how much Topps was always looking for the kids and not the adults in 64, I'm still perturbed there was no Stan the Man Musial card in 64. Make him card number one, honor his career. He retired. He had 3,630 hit at the time. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, National League player, definitely of his generation. Give him a farewell card. Maybe showing him on second base or something like that as he's leaving the field. Do you think they were mad at him for the in the field? I don't think Tops didn't didn't play hard do those or... type of cards in those days. I don't think they were mad at him. Remember, the kids were saying, oh, he's not active anymore. We don't care. Because it's not just Tops. In 1980, there's no Thorman Munson in memoriam card. I was collecting in 58, and when Stan Muse, you finally had a card, that was a huge deal. So much so, they triple printed it, but it was probably equally as big a deal as Mickey Mantle on those all I Remember, the Mantle All-Star in that series is also triple printed. Right. There's a lot of those cards out there. This is not 64 or 5, but it's similar in one way to 65. I always had an easier time getting the last series in 58. Then I did get in the first few series in 58. I think it was brilliant marketing to put those uh, Sporting News All-Stars. They were Sporting News All-Stars. They were the first to be Sporting News All-Stars. Sport Magazine or Sporting News? First year was Sport, right? Maybe they were Sport then because they're 58 to 62. 64, they're no All-Star cards. Right. But I think that was a big enticement for the last series. And 64, the last series, we say they're not that tough, but there's just not many tough cards in there. Now, in hindsight, you can get them. But 63 was really tough. Back in the days, I knew some people considered the middle series of 63 tougher than the high numbers. And yet, the, it, it, that, I think, has also corrected itself. And the last two series are, I think, more properly priced higher than, like, the third or the fourth series now. So to really get respect as a vintage card set, it really almost means you have to have a tough series and some really tough cards to make the chase really challenging. We're both saying 64 and 65 were not as challenging as sets before or after. Are no, we? the three toughest time numbers in that period are 61, 66, 67. 62 and 3 are just a level under 61, 6, and 7. 64 and 5 are the easiest time numbers of that period. I think you're right. That's almost why they're underrated. The 64 Pete Rose is such more an aesthetically pleasing card than the 63. It's a nicer photo. He's got the trophy card on it. That's one where the second year card is much more aesthetically pleasing than the much more expensive rookie card. And it's an easier card to get to. The personally autographed version of it is what's on my card wall of the 64 row. 